Within a galaxy permanently at war, there are no shortage of targets for those tasked with eliminating troublesome individuals. Renegade bureaucrats, military leaders, leaders of rebelling citizenry who need to be removed before they can become so popular that their death would leave them a martyr and condemn a hive city to an inevitable insurrection and a problematic waste of resources. As we have previously covered, assassins have existed for thousands of years and little has changed as humanity entered the darkened horror of the far future. They have become innumerable although still of course rare in the grand scheme of things, applying their carefully crafted and specific methodology for whatever matter they're tasked with resolving. The greatest known assassins belong to the Order of Imperial Assassins, known as the Officio Assassinorum, which originated during the Emperor's Great Crusade. Those within the Order were sworn to mercilessly hunt down enemies of the Emperor and mankind, utilising the arts of stealth and subterfuge. In the beginning, the Officio Assassinorum operated under very fragile rules of anonymity and secrecy, gathering in a hidden location within the vast Imperial Palace on Terra. Later, as things progressed, they established assassin temples, with each temple led by a director Primus, answering to a master of assassins, who was, in those earliest days, Malkador the Sigilite himself. The Officio Assassinorum served the Emperor faithfully, ensuring compliance with treaties and the preservation of newly conquered worlds. During the Horus Heresy, the Assassinorum would be tasked with assassinating Horus Lupercal, the arch traitor and war master. And although they failed in their mission, their actions led to the establishment of the temple disciplines that have remained through to the contemporary Imperium in M41. While there have been many noteworthy incidents for the Assassinorum in their history, in mid-M32, of course, the Assassinorum faced the scandal known as the Beheading. Draken van Gorich, the Grand Master of the Assassinorum, ordered the assassination of the High Lords of Terror, triggering a destructive power struggle for control of the Imperium. The conflict was resolved when the Chapter Master of the Ultramarines, Agnathio, in cooperation with other leaders of various Space Moon chapters, they put an end to the fighting, bringing stability once again and restoring the positions for the High Lords of Terror. Also, of course, the Age of Apostasy, M36, the Assassinorum faced internal fractures and corruption under the reign of Goge Van Dyer. Van Dyer was widely suspected and effectively confirmed to have abused the power of the Assassins for his personal gain, eliminating those who opposed him. And upon Van Dyer's death, Yarek, a Kaladus assassin, attempted to seize control of the Assassinorum. But the true Grand Master, aware of Yarek's plans, switched places with their double and launched an assault on the traitor assassin temples. The ensuing battle resulted in the eradication of the corrupt elements, with the Grand Master having achieved his goal, then fading into a self imposed exile. The Inquisition would discover the true events behind the conflict, but chose to seal forever the truth. They would establish then the Ordo Sicarius to monitor and oversee the Officio Assassinorum to help prevent future corruptions. But from its inception, the Assassinorum emerged as one of the many lethal physical extensions of the Emperor's will, ultimately dedicated to preserving his vision of a united Imperium by any means necessary. These were not mass infantry assaults or the colossal bipeds of titanic warfare. They were the refined surgical instruments of retribution, honed through a crucible of absolutely merciless training. Through the often troubling and tangled webs of their own ascension, anonymity and secrecy were the assassins' allies, allowing them to strike against unseen enemies within, bringing down those who dared to defy the Emperor's rule. As the millennia unfolded, the Imperium faced tumultuous upheavals and cataclysmic conflicts. Imperial assassins largely stood as beacons of loyalty, their very existence intertwined with the rise and fall of empires. And while there were periods of tumult, these were overshadowed by loyalty. And while individuals strayed, in the darkest hours the indomitable spirit of the assassins persevered. Their blades pierced the shroud of heresy, and with lethal artistry did they paint the stars with the blood of tyrants and traitors. Singular actions occurring out of sight and out of mind determined the course of entire battles, often tipping the scales of victory and defeat in campaigns spread across entire systems, any rumour of an Imperial Assassin's presence instilling terror in the hearts and souls of those who dared challenge the Imperium's supremacy. In a chaotic galaxy, 
Imperial Assassins serve as the ultimate reminder for those tasked in maintaining the balance and the complexities of their own power against securing order within Imperial worlds. They epitomise the mortal sacrifices deemed necessary by a galaxy plagued by chaos and eternal war. From the darkest depths of M30 to the fractured era of M41, Imperial Assassins have left an indelible mark upon the Imperium and indeed the galaxy itself, demonstrating an often acute and fragile equilibrium between order and anarchy, between life and death. For they are simultaneously the instruments of destruction and the sentinels of order, giving hope to worlds on the brink of catastrophe and shattering the egomaniacal delusions of corrupted power-mad conspirators. Imperial Assassins exist to remind those who have drifted too far, forgotten their place, or otherwise ignored edicts in favour of themselves rather than meeting their responsibilities to the Imperium. That while he may have sat upon the Golden Throne immobile for 10,000 years, none can escape nor ignore the will of the Emperor of Mankind, or more importantly, his furious wrath. Of course, while there are those more commonly known assassins in the Indomitus Age of M41, and by commonly I mean Imperial commanders who may have once in their lives heard that an assassin was operating in their campaign, inquisitors and other bureaucratic services who came into contact with them, Astartes, Sororitas and so on, it's certain that the vast majority of humanity have little to any knowledge of those within the Vindicare, the Calidus, the Eversor, and perhaps especially the Calexus. It's possible they have heard rumours, merchants' tales about Imperial assassins, but it's extremely unlikely that they are aware of the specifics of the temples and their existence. Yet, how many of us can say that we've heard of the Maiorus, the Vanus, the Adamus? There have of course, as I say, been innumerable varieties of assassin throughout the millennia, and certainly not all of them sanctioned by the Imperium nor even human in origin, or otherwise meeting default classifications for an assassin, but those committed just to the art of death and the efficient removal of problematic individuals will always continue to exist in a galaxy consumed by war. Today we look at the lesser known Imperial assassins, before finally, whenever I can follow on from here, we will look into the most bizarre and unsanctioned assassins from the depths of Hive Cities to the Xenos and even the elites among the Imperial nobility. If we begin anywhere, it should be with the Adamus Assassin, one of the oldest formal assassins for the Imperium and very often now one of the most uncommon to see, an enigmatic and lethal sect which exemplifies the relentless pursuit of perfection focused on the blade mastery seen in the Pan-Pacific region of Terra, whilst all assassin temples are highly elusive, the Adamus assassins are especially shrouded in secrecy, for their very existence is known to only a select few, and this is believed to be due to their prior extended history having been obscured by the losses around the end of the Dark Age of Technology. How they came to be in the aftermath only exists now through scattered fragments of information that have surfaced, describing an order which is deeply rooted in discipline, adaptability and ruthless efficiency. Rumours persist though, with some accounts suggesting that they were in fact forged during the time of the Great Crusade, meticulously crafted by the Emperor himself to carry out the most critical and sensitive missions. Others speculate that their genesis lies in the darkest corners of the Imperium's clandestine laboratories, where the boundaries of human potential were pushed to their limits and beyond. The Adamus follow a very ancient approach, less jarring and strange than some of the other more well-known temples. The Adamus are focused on understanding an enemy, to study them and to possess the elite skills and tools performed with perfection to reflect any of an enemy's strengths, weaknesses, that will then thereby enable them to carry out their lethal tasks in any environment, from the dense jungles of death worlds to the towering spires of hive cities. As assassins, they are similarly to the Vindicare and the Calidus, masters of stealth and subterfuge. Even the most heavily fortified bastions and cities are no obstacle to them, their presence is most often entirely undetected until the very moment they strike, which comes with merciless calculated precision eliminating targets swiftly and silently, leaving no room for escape or very often any response, or even the target having the most minimal awareness that anything has happened. Just pure, instantaneous death. 
What differentiates the Adamus assassins is their unwavering commitment to perfection in the practicing of their blade craft. Every aspect of their training and conditioning is honed to unrelenting perfection, from their physical prowess to their mental fortitude. While some of the other temples focus on a specific area, long range for the Vindicare, disguise and infiltration for the Calidus, or intimidating carnage for the Eversaur. The Adamus follow a broader approach, applying whatever is needed to achieve an objective. In this discipline, they are able to seamlessly blend into any environment, even assuming alternate identities. Their rigorous training and genetic modification gifts them with heightened senses and reflexes, not dissimilarly to other assassins, and transforming themselves into living weapons capable of far surpassing the limitations of ordinary mortals. But what defines them is the purity of this discipline, their ranging abilities to infiltrate and strike, recon, and learn some creative way to eliminate a target without it even having been known to be an assassin that were the cause, or to allow themselves to be very visibly the weapon who destroys that rogue planetary governor. That is to say, they can either be entirely invisible or deliberately highly visible. The weapon they are most likely to employ in an assassination is their Nemesai Blade. Forged by techrites of their clade, each is patterned after an ancient Terran artifact, which is a nod perhaps to their origins being prior to the Emperor, as all these blades are held in stasis within the Adamus Temple, and despite them not appearing to have any kind of augmentations, not a power or a force weapon, they seem to bear an extremely sharp edge on the blade, capable of cutting through flesh and armour with impunity, which raises further questions as to their composition and the fact that they are so carefully guarded and held within the temple vault. One might speculate they're in fact some unknown material or ancient process held secretly to the Adamus, dating back perhaps to the Dark Age of Technology. If it's needed, their more ranged tool is the less elegantly named Needle Spine Blaster, which combines rapid bolt tech with a needler. These are Imperial weapons capable of cutting a hole through armour using a laser, before being then followed by a needle projectile that delivers venom or poison to an enemy. In the case of the Adamus, their needle darts are made from an unknown alloy fired behind this pulse of Laz energy, thereby killing a target with what appeared to be a simple Laz blast, often to leave an enemy wearing even power armour confounded as to how their fellow may have fallen. So while the Adamus are less well known than the main temples of the Assassinorum in M41, their reputation and heritage are legendary. They are one of the oldest, most pure forms of assassin. Where they're deployed, they deliver a terrifying vengeance on behalf of the Emperor and the Imperium, delivering their signature decapitation strikes with their blades cutting cleanly through even the most artisan of armour. Escaping before any even knew they were there, and in the wake of a terrified and distraught entourage of followers, who likely will fall into the hands of the more standard Imperial operatives soon after, through shock and the destabilising panic that has consumed them. Then we come to the Vanus, who are an intriguing arm of the Assassinorum, and also act as its intelligence gathering temple, because their operatives are trained as so-called infosites, who use predictive engines and simulations that give them some semblance of foresight, which assists them in determining the most likely way to orchestrate the successful outcome of missions, using all available data to best plan and operate in the elimination of targets. Whilst they are of course stealthy and lethal operatives, as are any within the original clade assassins of the Imperium, they also understand that knowledge and reality do not always lead to the truth. The judgement comes to all, and clarity they believe is merely a consequence of one's isolation, be it self-imposed or otherwise. Most interesting is the fact that Vanus operatives generally avoid deploying into the field, preferring to remain in the Vanus sanctums whereby they deploy using telepresent means. This is not something that is particularly clarified, but we can assume what this essentially is alluding to is their hacking into systems remotely, or otherwise manipulating tech which enables them to carry out their tasks, placing data where it needs to be, and other highly subtle suggestive actions, amending records and data that will inevitably lead to accusations or reprisals. There are those who have described the Vanus as assassins who do not simply erase the physical being, but also the memory, the very existence of the target as a social construct. They eliminate all who know the target, and the removal of all data pertaining to them. 
This is not exclusively the modus operandi of the Vanus, but it is certainly possible where necessary. In some respects, the Vanus are more terrifying than many other assassins, even if they do not inflict extreme physical trauma. But their ability to make it as if one never even existed at all is chilling. The Vanus were originally not known for being lethal in their operations, for it was seen as necessary just to have an assassin clade who could remove individuals as effectively and even brutally as others, but without needing to result in a terminal solution. Such scenarios are in fact extremely beneficial to be able to execute, because there are many situations whereby the physical elimination of an individual will not necessarily solve a problem. In fact, in many cases, it may even make it far worse, where one problematic individual shifts from being an irritation to becoming a martyr, very often this is a worse problem to have and may inflame more than it will dissolve a rebelling populace or a planet that's on the brink of declaring itself independent from the Imperium. So the members of the Vanus Clade specialised in keeping watch over all aspects of the Imperium, and I think one could argue not entirely dissimilarly to the Inquisition. Their data stacks were overflowing with data that could ruin a senior official forever, their speciality was in non-lethal operation, blackmail, scandal, and may force individuals to just remove themselves without them even having enacted any kind of actual campaign against them, lest the truth come out. Their own adage stated that the cleanest kill is one that another performs in your stead, with no knowledge of your incitement. Effectively saying, it's far better to have some other person carry out the assassination for you, and without the knowledge that they are even being manipulated into doing so. The Vanus assassins are the ultimate manipulators. Their info site's scouring of data is said to never have resulted in an error of judgment, which to me sounds wildly debatable, but then it's exactly the sort of thing that those engaged in the highest levels of manipulation and propaganda would say. The Vanus additionally have special operatives known as cryptocrats, who are tasked with generally encrypting and securing information for the Vanus. Essentially, they are both security and analysts, who are also capable of breaking encrypted information and hacking into data terminals to unlock any information required by a Vanus assassin, carefully assessing any information to establish its authenticity, ensuring that it has not been manipulated by an external force. The approach of the Vanus operatives is to explore every possible angle when assessing how to deal with their target, from a macro-administrative level through to broad geopolitical issues upon a world. Nothing is overlooked nor underestimated, and this ensures that they execute some of the cleanest assassinations in the galaxy, most often never having even left their own sanctum or anybody even being aware that they had anything to do with it. While the preference and vast majority of Vanus assassinations take place without them ever having left their chamber, let alone set foot upon a world, if pressed to it, they are as capable as any other assassins in engaging in the far more physical practices. In this, their augmentations prove equally advantageous, for a Vanus infosite is capable of processing all available data in their locality and beyond at an astonishing speed. They're able to breach secured and encrypted systems, remote access weapon targeting and other control systems. They can even go so far as to access the Mechanicus news sphere. They could, for example, lock down bulkhead doorways in a ship and vent the air out. They can do all manner of activities and processes which allow them to cause havoc or even instruct semi-automated constructs of the tech priests to go rogue. The Vanus have even been known to send small swarms of organic metal fly-like automata which can breach data cables and pass through data which they feed back to the operative. Each of those net flies were relatively unsophisticated individually, but en masse their networking skills allowed the information they transferred to be condensed into a coherent picture of what was actually occurring visually, physically, in the immediate surroundings of the assassin, enabling the generation of 3D maps and other nearby structures, as well as deploying monitoring beads throughout any given zone to give real-time updates on localized enemy traffic and other information. So through the use of these drones, the Vanus can gain an impressively accurate picture of anything occurring in a localized or broad area for both offensive and defensive purposes, giving them perhaps some of the most accurate real-time visual data anywhere in the galaxy. 
Lastly, then their wrist mounted sympathetic data psychs enable them to scrape and rip local data, injecting damaged scrap code to enemy systems, or if absolutely necessary, they can serve as a brutal melee tool capable of breaching even heavy armor. And there are, of course, so many scenarios by which a Vanus operative could achieve their goals. The manipulation of those in the immediate circles of a target is something that is most commonly utilized. Exploiting humans' own jealousy, lust for power, or other manipulations twisted by either injected fabrications or simply true revelations that make an individual's position now entirely untenable. In many ways, the Vanus Assassin's methodology is one of the most favorable in terms of the Imperium's general needs, for while it's true that ultimately the power and authority of the Imperium will crush any uprisings upon a world, the messy execution of someone will always send a powerful message. But that could also risk making them a martyr, and thereby extending a problematic situation far beyond what is deemed a constructive period for resolution, especially if that world is focused on production in a system or region which is heavily relying upon it. In those scenarios, far better that a Vanus infosite can manipulate a subordinate to eliminate those who rise to lead rebellions, those with the charisma and the strength of will to hold such a position as a rebel leader are in fact rare, and those in their immediate circles always like to imagine that they could do the same if only they had the chance. They could be the ones to free their people and be forever known for their success. Except in reality, this is rarely the case. And when they turn on their leader, almost inevitably insurrections and rebellions against imperial authority implode, burn out, or otherwise disintegrate with very little effort on the part of local militias or arbiters, which is generally far better, because then they are not seen as either directly or indirectly responsible, and neither is the broader Imperium. The beauty of the Vanus methodology is that not only will it diffuse a situation, but also potentially dissuade those who did so from considering it in the future, seeing their abject failure as a reminder of their place in the general imperial order of things. Because after all this wild talk of rebellion, freedoms, planetary self-determination, this is delusional dangerous thinking, Citizen 37614-A210, you best stick to your work, and if it helps you feel any better, Enjoy this nutritious starch cube. What's in it? Never you mind. The Venenum assassins are the masters of poison and silent death, a specialized sect within the Assassinorum and the most irritating to pronounce of the assassins. Born in a crucible of secrecy and trained in the art of chemical warfare, these lethal operatives strike fear into the hearts of their enemies, but not through explosive shock assaults or graphic violence. Their unique expertise lies in their deadly proficiency with poisons, a weapon of choice that sets them apart from their fellow assassins. Venenum assassins wield a vast arsenal of toxic concoctions, each designed to deliver swift and agonizing death to their targets from paralyzing venoms to lethal neurotoxins. Their poisons tailor made to exploit the weaknesses of their adversaries through meticulous study and experimentation. Venenum assassins have mastered the art of crafting and administering these deadly brews, ensuring their effectiveness in a myriad of combat scenarios. As with all assassins, the Venenum training regime is as demanding as it is lethal. They undergo rigorous physical conditioning and mental fortitude, honing their bodies and minds into perfect instruments of destruction. This also includes enduring the effects of various toxins, building their immunity and their resistance, enabling them to operate with lethal efficiency in highly toxic environments, as well as, of course, the standard field craft such as being able to blend seamlessly into their surroundings, thereby through the use of subterfuge and an adept knowledge of social dynamics, allowing them to infiltrate even the most heavily fortified locations without arousing any suspicion. As with nearly all the assassin temples, mastery in the art of deception makes them the ultimate unseen predators, striking swiftly to remove a target before disappearing into the shadows. Throughout history, the use of poisons in covert actions has been a dark and intriguing aspect of human affairs, employed by both states and individuals as a means of eliminating their enemies, or achieving strategic goals. From ancient times to the modern day, poison has always held a sinister allure, offering a silent, insidious method of attack that leaves little trace behind. And herein lies, to a degree at least, the significance of the Venenum Assassin. 
Its position in the cultural memory of humanity through the use of poisons as assassination weapons and delivery systems, for throughout human history, poisons have often featured in clandestine operations and political intrigue, from the ancient world to the Renaissance period and even contemporary times. Individuals sought to harness the power of toxic substances to eliminate their enemies discreetly or send a powerful message to reach those who thought they were beyond the reach of their enemies or justice. In the ancient world, poisons were far more commonly or adeptly used due to the general inability to detect, treat or identify those who would seek to remove individuals from power using such poisons. Within many ancient cultures where power struggles and rivalries were ever present, to safeguard those in power, there would often be those within a specific role to test food before it were deemed safe for those in those positions of power. In ancient China, for example, a complex system of food testing known as Taster Protocol was implemented to safeguard the emperor. This involved the careful examination of meals to ensure they were free from poison. And this role was held in quite high regard. Individuals were specially selected and trained to sample the emperor's dishes before they were presented to him. The task was twofold, to detect any potential toxins or contaminants that might harm the emperor and to, if it ever happened, act as a sacrificial buffer in case the food was indeed poisoned. And this was something we saw throughout the ancient world. While these food tasters apparently underwent rigorous trainings to develop senses paired with an acute knowledge of toxic substances, familiarising themselves with the properties and the effects of the various poisons, using then these expertise to identify suspicious odours, tastes or unusual appearances in the dishes they sampled. Their very lives depended on their own vigilance and ability to discern the presence of lethal substances. It also in this time saw the use of silver, whereby placing a small piece of of silver, often a needle or chopstick, into the food or beverage that was to be consumed had the belief that if the food contained any harmful substances or toxins, the silver would react with them, causing a visible discoloration or tarnishing the silver as it came into contact with a poisonous substance, providing some extra layer of security. Of course, we know now that much of this was more out of paranoia and a sense of needing to do something rather than nothing. Just how effective testers of food could be realistically is fairly open to speculation. There were known instances of food tasters becoming poisoned before their own masters succumbed, but generally given the length of time required for a poison to take effect, even a fairly potent substance still had a working time needed to take effect whilst it was mixed in with food, unless it was heavily present, which was often difficult. It was more likely luck than anything else if the powerful individual survived and their tester maybe died to the poisons. Similarly, the silver used for testing may have reacted to a limited number of substances in this context, and its overall ability to be beneficial likely was not very significant. Anyone genuinely seeking to eliminate someone in this ancient period had primarily to deal with the often bigger issue of gaining correct access to the food served to those individuals of power, and that very much depended on how contained and secure the inner workings of a palace or an estate were. This is likely why in the ancient times, poisons as a means to remove a problematic family member or rival was more prevalent than those in the true positions of power, such as an emperor. Although in saying that, very often it was their own family within those enclosed environments that were the ones trying to remove them. So from this historical backdrop emerges the Venenum Assassin, who embodies the legacy of poison as a deadly art form refined to an unprecedented degree. They are the masters of toxicology, possessing an intricate knowledge of a vast array of lethal substances, from venomous serpents to the deadliest concoctions brewed within their secretive laboratories. The venom assassins wield poison as a silent and insidious weapon, striking their targets without detection, leaving little if any trace behind, and often very little trace of the individual for that matter. The Venenum Temple's techniques revolve, as with all the assassins, around precision, timing, knowledge of their targets. Their understanding, though, of physiology and biochemistry further enables them to exploit vulnerabilities and tailor poisons accordingly. Whether it's a slow-acting toxin that gradually weakens a target, or a fast-acting venom that induces immediate paralysis, the Venenum Assassin's choice of poison is carefully calibrated to ensure absolute maximum effectiveness. Much like their historical counterparts, they possess this vast 
arsenal of delivery systems to administer their lethal payloads, injectors concealed within wrist-mounted mechanisms, needle-like darts coated in deadly substances, and concealed vials of potent toxins, some of which are in fact so powerful that in the aftermath all that may remain of their victims is a bubbling pool of molecular matter. Other poisons may be airborne and eliminate an entire council or family within their own personal quarters. So while some assassins may still hold on to a semblance of honour in their eliminations, for the Imperium, in its unending desperate struggle for survival, there's little thought afforded for conventional moral standards. So the use of poison as a weapon aligns perfectly with the Imperium's pragmatic ends justifying the means approach. In a universe teeming with heresy, Xenos threats and internal strife, the Venenum assassins play a very necessary role, maintaining the fragile equilibrium of the Imperium's power structure, and while for some the use of poisons by assassins could raise loose ethical questions, justice, honour, fairness, the value of life itself, any nuanced implications surrounding an assassin's actions invite reflections even on the nature of power, the sacrifices demanded for survival, and the ethical boundaries required to navigate a hostile galaxy. In the most crude example, is the removal of one objectively innocent but disruptive life worth the survival of an entire hive city or even a world? For all of the assassins and the Imperium, this is not even a question and one they have continually shown they have absolutely no issue in crossing over this line. For those of us outside that system, it's potentially more of an open question. For those who serve within the Venenum Temple, their secretive sanctuary serves as a crucible for their deadly arts. Within its walls, they engage in endless research and development, constantly refining their poisons, discovering new ways to enhance their effectiveness. Shrouded in secrecy, they push the boundaries of poison craft to new deadly heights, to enable them to take on any objective required, from the removal of enemy commanders or other agents of the Imperium, through the neutralization of specific individuals to cripple enemy infrastructure or heavily impact the outcome of key battles. These are the important roles for the assassins. And from the perspective of the Venenum, every enemy has a weakness, even the alien and the demon. Xenos tailored toxins can be synthesized in doses that only they themselves can be trusted with their use, lest the potent priceless drops be wasted. They even are said to have the ability to produce psychic poisons, such as said to have been gathered from the Emperor's own tears at the foot of the Golden Throne. It is said that such poisons may even be capable of laying low the most powerful greater demons. In the Dark Galaxy of the Imperium, only the Venenum can be entrusted with delivering such powerful weapons which not only destroy the enemies of the Imperium, but indeed decide the fate of entire worlds and entire systems. Then lastly, it seems necessary to at least make mention of the Mare Aurus Temple, the Renegade Assassin Temple. To suggest that very little is known of the Maeorus is an understatement. They were only revealed to us in a namesake narrative known as the Seventh Retribution, in which a Grand Master of the Calexus Temple reveals to Captain Lysander of the Imperial Fists the existence of the Seventh Temple of the Assassinorum. This is the only instance of the Maeorus ever having been mentioned. While each temple is focused on their specific art of death, they are most often focused upon the elimination of the individual. Earlier I described how the Vanus assassins were often a useful tool in the removal of disruptive individuals, but without making them a martyr or otherwise creating a counterproductive situation. While technically possible, if an idea is heavily entrenched in a society, say for example a renegade noble leadership, who all have been consumed with an ideology that runs counter to the agenda of the Imperium, the number of individuals and the soft bleed of their outlook is more difficult for an assassin to be effective in neutralizing. Something like a rebelling parliament upon an imperial world, those do exist, or populace that have established some kind of council to lead them who have then been manipulated and constructed a cult-like mentality among them are just as dangerous as a single leader, but far more difficult to purge and remove cleanly without causing massive collateral damage. 
Of course, this stands on the assumption that in the eyes of the Imperium, salvaging the general populace is even worthwhile, and that they don't just send in a purging force of the Inquisition, the Sororitas, Imperial Guard, Planetary Militia, Arbites, or any and all of the above. In response to such scenarios, the Maorus was created. Their focus was upon the elimination of multiple individuals, but who existed as one entity conceptually, such as a cult, a resistance group, a corrupt government, or some other deviant organization that posed a high risk to the destabilization of a world. This included noble families and their bloodlines, and these were a common potential target, as they often held significant power upon imperial worlds and were reticent to allow outsiders into their inner workings. Thus, they were at high risk of external or internal corruption. In a dire situation that could not be resolved by the removal of one or two powerful members of a noble family, the deployment of a Maorus may have been appropriate, or so they thought. To this end, this specific type of assassin had been designed to be able to track genetic signatures and thereby identify their intended victims. The Maorus was designed to kill without weapons, Upon infiltrating, say, a hive city and its spires, an assassin was entirely isolated. For those of the six core temples, this usually was not a major issue. They relied on their abilities to bring them to a point whereby they were able to make their singular kill and then escape. Even in a worst case scenario, their heightened physical abilities and training should allow an assassin of any temple to survive a problematic extraction. Maorus, though, were in many ways perhaps most comparable to the Eversor assassin, for they faced rarely a clean assassination, but instead a chaotic, brutal slaughter that became increasingly more extreme once an action was set in motion. The Maorus assassins were trained to kill with no weapons, only their bare hands, in air quotes, except bare hands was not really a particularly accurate description, because their unique and bizarre physiology would break down a body into raw biomass and transform it instantly into weapon mutations from the assassin. The Maorus, for obvious reasons, are therefore problematic for these very terrifying mutating capabilities. After their initial kill, something any assassin is more than capable of achieving, they use that biomass to fuel horrifying mutations, limbs which split apart, lashing whips of gore shooting out from their body, and with each additional kill, they become only exponentially stronger. They're quite literally a living weapon, fueled by the bodies of the dead. Please insert your Tyranid or Resident Evil analogies in the comments section now. The Maorus were created originally by the Mechanicus, which you may think sounds extremely unusual, except less so when we learn these were indentured heretics, Mechanicus who had strayed from the Puritan doctrines of the Machine God and into the bizarre biologist research necessary to create such an abhorrent creature. The Assassinorum had long attempted to gain leverage over these members of the Mechanicus that they might seek to create these mutagenic adaptations using both the naturally mutating humanoids or even Xenos who displayed some shape-shifting and biomass adapting capabilities. You can guess perhaps where that genetic material is speculated as having originated from. The Temple of the Maorus was not traditional either. It was a bizarre camp of forbidden experimentation, which sounds like a fairly lightweight description when you consider that within these camps, there were being carried out horrific experimentations and vivisections on live individuals. Elsewhere, many hundreds if not thousands were being rendered down to provide the adequate genetic material to forge the very first of the Maorus assassins. So, a camp of forbidden experimentation is really a very thin description. It was far, far, far more abhorrent and disturbing. The development of the Maorus assassins was not exactly an enlightened beginning, and one may reasonably question how the entire concept even reached these initial stages. It was a concept so clearly exterior to even the Imperium's barely present moral compass, although admittedly perhaps not by much. Thankfully, an experiment was all that it remained, for their first success would also be the last. This creation, who was known as Legion Strauss, turned against the Imperium, deciding that they were so powerful they could potentially overthrow the Imperium. And this Maorus assassin continued to evade capture or destruction by the authorities at what is estimated for roughly 1,000 years. But the situation became so dire and the Assassinorum so desperate to conceal this disaster 
They even made agreements with Chaos Demons and Traitor Astartes to help to contain the monstrosity who was confined upon the world of Opus. The Assassinorum had hoped that the continual deluge of Chaos forces and cults would eventually force their creation out into the open and give them a chance of destroying it. This only came to pass when eventually the Imperial Fists and Inquisition were brought into the fray and all-out war was declared upon the world. In its final attempts to survive, the Maoris Assassin revealed the true extent of its horrific mutations. First, in its conflict with both the Captain of the Imperial Fists and a Master of the Calexus, its entire centipede-like torso split open, four massive clawed limbs grabbing this Master of the Assassinorum, to which they saw within it beat three engorged massive hearts. It was an industrial bio-machine of destruction, and as soon as the Calexus would sever limbs and tendrils, new ones replaced them. Despite the onslaught from a master of the assassins, a vindicare, and a captain of the Imperial Fists, the Maorus was able to continually anticipate and use its own available biomass to resist any incoming severe wounds. Throwing out tentacles and tendrils that permeated the ground, they sprang up around the entangled Captain Lysander, but his Hammer Fist of Dawn did little if anything against the pulsing flesh that was steadily crushing him. The Assassin demonstrated its abilities by design, tearing through a brother of the Imperial Fists nearby while it held Lysander in place. It was also quite adept at handling the Calexus Master Assassin and shrugging off any other incoming ranged fire, but the Calexus Master made a final effort to stab through one of its hearts. But as the Maorus mutated again, it adapted into a powerful set of jaws around the Assassin, who was then bisected at the waist, dropping mangled to the ground. Ultimately, after a relentless pursuit, Captain Lysander would follow the Maorus assassin into a fuel line upon the world, but was foiled by a world eater who ignited the fuel, consuming the loyal Astartes in flame. Upon the examination, though, of the remains of the Calexus master assassin, they discovered a data shard in their spine, which revealed ancient recordings of the initial construction of the Maorus, and how they quickly lost control of it. Worse, they discovered still that the Maorus was in fact able to reproduce and could incubate its own new offspring in the form of eggs, which gave the significant troubling possibility that soon there could be an army of Maorus assassins. It would ultimately take Captain Lysander and an Eversaur assassin to complete the termination of the Maorus monstrosity, along with its bizarre shredded torso and egg sacs containing its young of which the captain threw into a massive pool of lava. The Imperial Fists viewed the Assassinorum from here on as an enemy given its reckless disregard for the potential consequences and also deceitfully enlisting the aid of his chapter in their own messy affairs. Whilst there has been no further reported existence of the Maorus, it's at the very least plausible that some offspring somewhere survived. A millennia is a long time, it's anyone's guess as to if the Maorus creation truly was ended for all time upon the world of Opus at the hands of the Imperial Fist's Captain Lysander, and that is an extremely troubling issue. In the dark expanse of the galaxy and the Imperium in M41, those such as the Venenum, the Adamus, the Vanus, and the horrifying era of judgement that created the Maorus emerge as chilling embodiments of the paranoia and terror that grips humanity. They are the moral microcosm that pervades the verse, standing as a haunting mirror held up to reflect the Imperium's questionable approach to retain their power and control by any means necessary, no sacrifice too small or too large. Imperial Assassin's insidious abilities and sinister presence embody the true reality of a horror created through the monstrosity that is the Imperium in M41, a galactic empire of manipulation, greed, power and destruction, which is in itself in many ways a venomous coiled serpent laying down amidst the dull sifted detritus that is the decay of human morality. Driven by dogmatic zealotry and a ruthless pursuit of power, thriving on oppression and conformity, disregarding the lives of its own citizens in its relentless meat grinder of war, any sense of moral ambiguity is long extinguished, and those who serve the Assassinorum truly embody the darkness nurtured by fear, fanaticism, and the sacrifice of humanity's soul. They stand as reminders that the Imperium's lofty ideals of protection and order often come at great moral cost. In the face of the nightmare though that is chaos, one may reasonably ask, 
if such extreme lengths are required to survive, is humanity right to survive at all? Of course, others within the Imperium itself would state that the glory of the Emperor must be maintained at all costs. He is the light, the way, the only hope for humanity, and all must be given, no matter how high the price, to ensure his continued survival. When viewed through such a lens, then the existence of assassins serve a vital purpose that far outweighs any questions surrounding their actions. For in a galaxy racked by endless war, the ability for the Imperium to cling on to its dominion is in fact extremely impressive, and undoubtedly the absence of the elite assassins would have dire consequences for the Imperium and its struggle to survive in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium. It would be left entirely vulnerable to countless threats that seek to undermine its stability, mostly from within, which always is surprising I think for people to hear, but humanity itself is in fact one of the biggest threats to the stability of the Imperium. Therefore an assassin's ability to strike fear and maintain order serves as a significant deterrent against those who would challenge the Imperium's rule. Without this element of terror, enemies would be emboldened, leading to widespread rebellion, insurrection and the collapse of Imperial control. So merely the rumoured existence of these terrifying assassins, more than anything else, acts as a grim reminder to any would-be internal adversaries of the horrifying consequences they will face should they dare to ever defy the Imperium. Something they are certainly extraordinarily effective at, rooting out heretics, traitors, utilising their skills in deception and covert operations, so crucial for maintaining the Imperium's intricate web of intrigue, and that without their presence, subversive forces would go unchecked, causing the Imperium to fracture and fall into disarray. Of course, the leadership of the Imperium from a planetary level up understand all too readily that their choices are often between a range of unpalatable options, but entirely necessary to protect the Imperium from external and internal threats which seek to dismantle its very foundations. While assassins are so very few within the galaxy of humanity, their presence within the Imperium is paramount. Any moral questions raised by their actions are entirely eclipsed by the necessity of their role in protecting humanity from the relentless onslaught of an extraordinarily hostile galaxy, that humanity continues to, and not for the first time across the past 10,000 years of history, stands upon the brink of salvation or annihilation. <laughs>